pense à continuer de faire. Where we're counting down the almost the final minute uh, to the first uh, Gavi Zero Dose Intercountry Peer Learning Exchange. You should see on your screen there's one minute and five seconds remaining. Counting down now to the final seconds. I hope you will uh, count down with me. Thank you, Amina Yahaya, who says, happy to be part of this historic moment. We hope you'll tell us why this is historic. And here we go. All right, a warm welcome to you, Emre Dasatki from Geneva, Switzerland, and here with Charlotte and Bou from Ebolowa, Cameroon. How are you doing, Charlotte? I'm doing good, Reda, and really excited to get into discussing on Zero Dose. All right, for those of you who are just uh, joining us now, uh, who are, uh, si vous êtes francophone, eh bien, uh, on va vous montrer comment uh, se connecter au, à l'interprétation. Donc, uh, c'est très simple. Uh, et pour activer l'interprétation, vous cliquez sur Interprétation et vous choisissez Français. Euh, vous coupez l'audio original pour être sûr euh, de bien entendre. Et en particulier, uh, if you are going to speak, please use a headset. Don't speak while others are speaking and take your time so that the interpreters uh, can keep up. And before we dive in, I want to acknowledge and, and really uh, congratulate uh, 1,964 zero dose practitioners from 84 countries registered uh, for this uh, for this event. We know many of you will watch the recording or will catch up because due to connectivity issues. But just want to uh, uh, to acknowledge that. We'll come back to who is in the room. 89% um, of you are directly involved in zero dose work. Um, and most of you are from districts, facilities, and uh, region, regions of uh, your country. Uh, even though today we'll be uh, honoring, of course, two countries, Mali and uh, Bangladesh. Now, uh, Charlotte, I believe we're going to dive right in. And um, you may be surprised, this is not the traditional way. We are dispensing with a lot of the formalities. Um, about in today's event. We're diving right in with a first sharing of experience uh, from a zero dose practitioner from Bangladesh. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you, Reda. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Mohamed Soar Alam to uh, unmute uh, himself. And uh, Mohamed Soar Alam, please, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us who you are, where you work, and what you do. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening from Bangladesh. Uh, yeah. So my name is Mohammed Sarwar. Oh, wait. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and yeah. 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 Uh, Am I audible now? Yes, okay. we can hear you. So yes. I work for WHO and I am assigned to provide technical support on immunization and vaccine preventable disease at uh, Chittagong City Corporation. So this is the second largest city corporation in terms of population in Bangladesh and uh, it's also the poor city of Bangladesh and it has an area of like 161 square kilometer and we got around 4 billion population here and uh, 90,000 baht goho TRD and uh, it is divided into 41 words and 7 EPI zone. So EPI activities okay. here uh, are uh, run by local uh, government thank you. with the support from uh, Ministry of Health unlike uh, the rural areas where uh, most of the EPA activities are supported by Ministry of Health. So the city okay. is uh, as diverse Mohammed group Sower? of population. So with, uh, please, uh, please hold on. I believe Charlotte has questions for you. Industrial workers, slum and other uh, highest Mohammed community Sower? areas like uh, 
fishermen, snake charmers. Yes. Uh, Mohammed Sower, please. Uh, I'm going to. I'm coming back to what you. I have a series uh, series of questions for you that I would like you to answer so that we can better understand uh, your zero dose situation. So please, can you uh, unmute yourself and tell us what is the zero dose situation where you work and how do you know uh, that that is the situation? Are you able to unmute, please? I believe Sorer was quite ready to share his whole story all at once, but we want to make the point for all the speakers, uh, Sorer, we're asking you to, uh, to unmute now. Uh, please take your time. Charlotte will be asking you questions. That is the, the format uh, that will help everyone in the room better understand uh, your story. All right, Sower is, uh, I believe, having a technical difficulty. We know this will happen quite a lot. Again, this is uh, an event in which we have reached out to um, individuals, uh, zero-dose practitioners who are working in districts and facilities, sometimes in very difficult conditions, uh, and who are not able to, uh, not always able to get the connectivity that we would wish uh, for them to have. Um, Charlotte, it looks like uh, Sower is uh, stuck. Uh, he is not able to unmute. Uh, so I suggest that we uh, we go to uh, we go to Mali and come back uh, to. Uh, uh, to Bangladesh, unless uh, so where you are able to uh, now uh, now speak to us. If we are not able to get so where, I think uh, we have uh, Fantamari Kamara from Mali, who is uh, uh, already uh, on standby and the microphone is open uh, to answer the questions. So I see Fantamari Kamara, you are on two devices, uh, two mics are open. So please, can you mute yourself in one of the devices to avoid interferences when you speak? And then, uh, uh, so that you are ready to answer my questions. So hello to you, Fantamari Kamara. Yeah, so please go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Bonjour, tout le monde. Bonjour, Charlotte. Je suis Dr. Fantamari Kamara. Je travaille dans la troisième région du Mali, à Sikasso. Je suis le 10 district sanitaire de Sikasso. Je travaille pour l'UNICEF, comme assistant technique de la vie pour l'immunisation. Toute l'équipe de Sikasso est en train de le travail que nous avons suivi. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I believe Sower is back. So Charlotte, I leave it up to you. Uh, if we go back to Sower, who had Sower, you had launched into your story. We know you want to tell everything, but Charlotte is going was going to ask you questions. Et pour Fantamadi Camara, merci pour votre patience. Je pense qu'on va revenir à ce qui était initialement prévu, uh, avec le, en commençant par le Bangladesh, un des deux pays à l'honneur aujourd'hui. Back to you, Charlotte. Et, and let's just, just let me say that in an event that reaches and includes frontline practitioners, unlike so many events where we hear uh, global voices primarily, uh, this is the reality of connectivity challenges. Back to you, Charlotte. Uh, thank you so much, Reda. And uh, Mohamed Sower Alam, it's great to have you back. So my question to you was, what is the zero-dose situation where you work and how do you know about it? Well, uh, actually, we had uh, experience of, uh, you know, measles outbreak in nearby district, and there were scenarios uh, with indigenous communities that have language barriers and isolated communities, they were suffered measles outbreak. So uh, we took that learning and we started to look for these communities there uh, in our city corporation area. And actually, we uh, found a couple of communities like indigenous communities, uh, slum dwellers, fishermen communities in Chirong City Corporation. So uh, when we do uh, did uh, rapid convenience monitoring there, we actually uh, found uh, them. Many of them remain unvaccinated from even uh, from the program. So we robustly we up. Reda, I don't know if it's just me or it seems as though we lost. We just Muhammad. lost over. Okay, again, let me say this is perfectly normal. Please bear with us. Be patient. This is not, uh, uh, you know, many of the uh, practitioners, zero dose practitioners from districts and facilities who've made every effort to be here are having connectivity challenges. And that is just 
the, the, the daily reality that they live with. Uh, Sorwer, uh, I suggest then, uh, Charlotte, that if you could summarize for us, we have uh, you know, the key points until Sorwer is, uh, is able to speak with us again. Okay, Reda, so uh, he already no, shared... Okay, he's okay, back, back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm sorry about the connectivity problem here today. Uh, so we actually uh, started to, you know, update our uh, micro plan the East area list, and we listed out all those uh, communities uh, that we learned from uh, our uh, nearby districts experience, and we, uh, uh, you know, the uh, update our micro plan listing, uh, and also uh, with the support from WHO, we do did some innovative activities like did GIS uh, mapping of those areas and, uh, you know, put them uh, in the map to find out if there's any accessibility problem there also. So uh, with that, uh, you know, uh, kind of effort, we actually been able to minimize the zero dose uh, uh, communities and zero dose uh, children uh, 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 right now. And we haven't been able to, uh, we, we actually haven't seen any measles outbreak in last uh, three years uh, since those uh, outbreaks in nearby districts. So I think, uh, uh, this is uh, an example uh, uh, of uh, how we actually uh, learn from uh, uh, measles outbreak happened in nearby places, uh, who could be those uh, zero dose communities and start to search for these zero dose communities here also and update our micro plan that's supposed to be updated, which uh, used uh, previously is not to be uh, you know updated and copy pasted uh, previously but now uh, uh, our real uh, uh, you know micro planning happening and uh, from that comes from the bottom of the health system and we took uh, feedback from uh, different partners also as well as health workers to do the micro planning and listing of those high risk areas so that's how actually we are working here in Chitong city uh, thank you Okay, thank you, Mohamed. So uh, I have a question for you. You mentioned um, uh, micro planning uh, 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 from the lowest level. I want to find out uh, 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 how do you involve the community in the micro planning process? So thank you so much. That's actually a great question because uh, what happened previously, I, I, as I mentioned, the health workers uh, used to copy and paste uh, the previous year's plan. Now there, there is instruction to uh, discuss uh, with the local community leaders and also the religious uh, and influential personals uh, prior to do the listing, uh, talk to them. Uh, uh, for example, in Chirong City, we discuss uh, our local level micro planning with the uh, ward councillor, that is the city corporation elected member. He knows his area well. He knows he's involved in all sorts of, you know, government uh, planning and processes. So he gives us feedback that uh, this area ha has certain communities that is, uh, that, that is poor and that is uh, ha that have a migration problem so you can include these uh, people here so this is uh, one example we actually involved the community leaders and also we took feedback from you know uh, religious leaders also if uh, they have certain you know uh, communities uh, that may have uh, you know kind of uh, hesitancy problem that's how we involve the community to do the micro planning process okay my last question for you will be how do you know what you are doing is successful? Yes, thank you so much. So uh, I think data uh, calls for itself. Uh, as I mentioned, we haven't seen uh, any measles outbreak in Chittagong City or nearby district in last uh, couple of years. Uh, it's especially uh, since those three uh, huge outbreak and uh, response from national EPI and also at the local level. So we do not have many measles cases now. And also we are doing rapid convenience monitoring that is uh, biased uh, rapid convenience monitoring. We are going to the places where we think, uh, I mean, statistically, it is proven that there might be some, uh, you know, uh, children that uh, may have under immunized or zero dose problem. So when we're doing rapid convenience monitoring, we're actually getting very, uh, very few uh, zero dose and some under immunized problem, uh, under immunized children that is uh, due to migration problem. But uh, I think the monitoring uh, proves that uh, it's working. Uh, thank you very much, Mohamed. So, Alam, I'll turn right now to uh, Dr. Francois Gaz, who is uh, uh, our main guide on the site for uh, this uh, event. Francois, do you have any follow-up questions for Mohamed Sora to help us uh, better understand his story? Thank you, Charlotte, for your question. And thank you, Mohamed, for sharing your experience, which is an interesting one, using uh, measles outbreak to try to identify 
the zero dose or under immunized. I am, I would like your clarification on first more, was it more zero dose or under immunized? You know, it was, we call it the dropout uh, children. That's my first question. Uh, what was the main problem? They were immunized once, but there was no follow up. That's my first question. Can you clarify who were this group? And in this group, did you find different, you, you listed in your experience, different group affected by being under immunized or zero dose? Could, were they a particular group far more bigger than the others? So they were every one of those group listed at some zero dose. My first two questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, question. Uh, so uh, those three middle outbreak actually happened in the communities that were completely left out of uh, micro planning. That, is, that was first uh, finding from those outbreaks. So that was not, uh, the area was not covered by health workers. So they completely remained, mm -hmm. uh, you know, out of immunization program for years. So they were zero dose. That is the answer of first question. And I believe uh, measles uh, actually gives uh, triggers uh, as a signal. And Bangladesh has very uh, good uh, vaccine preventable disease surveillance system uh, supported by WHO. So uh, we actually, whenever getting a single measles cases, we are going to that uh, particular community to identify if there is any cases and what is the vaccination status. So uh, as you mentioned, yes, uh, probably the communities that were left out, uh, 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 probably it is a tip of the iceberg. There may be many more uh, communities is like that but you still uh, we are very uh, you know agile and uh, vigilant to uh, find out uh, for those communities and those communities had barriers like uh, you know they, they are indigenous communities uh, and isolated communities that doesn't you know uh, match with uh, local Bengali group of people and they have language barriers also so that's how uh, there is communication gap among health workers and uh, you know uh, beneficiaries also there so, so I think I clarified. Yes, thank you. My, my next question is to find out. It looks like, uh, you know, in general, Bangladesh does very well in providing service immunization services. Now, this group, where, where they could you clarify if this group had access? There was available services for vaccination, but they were not using. Or was it a mix of access, special access for language barrier, as you have mentioned? Or was it something else uh, would prevent it? You mentioned the uh, religious group that may be against. Or th so can you clarify a little bit more yes. the real problematic? Uh, okay. okay. So uh, in one of the outbreak in Chittagong Hill Tracks that has accessibility problem, like uh, hours to reach that uh, particular community. So that is a hard to reach area that definitely have accessibility problem. Problem. The remaining two uh, that actually doesn't have any accessibility problem. It was really nearby to the district and uh, city, but they did not participate actively in the immunization program. Neither uh, the health workers actually go to them and ask them or offer them immunization service. As I said, they were completely left out of the immunization micro planning uh, process. So it was a mix of uh, you know uh, uh, hard to reach uh, problem as well as uh, language barriers and uh, poor mm -hmm. mind this, I, I believe. And, and what something you mentioned that was very interesting was the true cause of the problem. And how did you inf identify them? It was by individual household survey. What did you do in practice to get the oh. reasons? What did you yes. visit so, both of zero dose house by house? Can you clarify? Yeah, so we uh, we use a uh, you know uh, mobile uh, uh, based technology the Kobo Collect tools, uh, and we have uh, developed application to uh, do household survey uh, to go uh, every uh, alternate house and find out the st immunization status of under two years children. That's how we actually uh, uh, you know surveyed and found out there was uh, you know uh, zero dose and under immunization problem. That's very good. Thank you for highlighting. So the involvement of community and highlighting that is sometimes a mix of issues between using the service offered or not having access to the service, even in an urban area. I think you, you have really pinpointed the problem. And maybe the last is, uh, for, you mentioned the monitoring and uh, on what are your indicators to monitor you doing better? <laughs> 
sorry, I, I didn't get you. What, what's your indicator to monitor that with what you do, you're having an impact? That means you're reducing yes. the number of zero dose or unimmunized. Yes, yes. yes. So uh, our, obviously, uh, the rapid convenience monitoring findings, uh, we have to uh, we have to have a you know to see at least 20 children every month so uh, this is being populated uh, yearly and when we do the analysis of the data for last two and three years we we see that uh, you know zero dose uh, number has uh, came down uh, significantly that is one indicator i would say we we do not have a uh, cut point or indicator like that we are, we only see the progress if we are uh, you know lessening the zero dose communities and zero dose children that is one point and also the measles and measles outbreak so we as i said we do not have uh, many measles cases and outbreak right now so So this is also a, another indicator to monitor. My, my last comment on the measles outbreak, as you know even more than me, is that if there is an outbreak, the virus is so contagious, it will contaminate a lot of kids and you may have to wait two or three years before. So our, the problem is how in absence of outbreak, what would you do, uh, what you plan to do to still make sure that those communities are rich permanently? Actually, uh, uh, the rapid convenience monitoring is being done by uh, a okay. surveillance medical officer network in Bangladesh. So we are like 60 per person doing the whole country. But government has planned to introduce it uh, this uh, application to uh, their staff also, uh, that is uh, the doctors and also the uh, supervisor level. So they will uh, do the same. I think uh, that that way we can actually uh, survey uh, those high risk uh, communities periodically and monitor uh, if there is any zero dose happening. That is uh, the plan for the future. I, I think government going to implement this thing. Thank you so much, Mohamed, for bringing this clarification of very interesting experience and everybody will be here, to, will be happy to hear your follow-up, I'm sure, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank Anybody you else? So Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, François and, uh, and Sorware. Um, before we go further, we're going to hear from fellow Zero Dose practitioners, Respond, React, potentially other guides, uh, guides on the side who are here with us from national teams, from global partners in response to Soware's story. We're going to mark a quick pause for acknowledgements and just to tell you who's in the room. First of all, 1,964 participants from 84 countries registered for this session. We know many of you, of course, are going to be watching the recording, catching up in other ways afterwards, but we do want to acknowledge there's something very, very powerful in this many frontliners, as you'll see, uh, interested in such an event. Um, we want to acknowledge uh, the uh, both the Bangladesh and Mali Ministries of Health and EPI teams, as well as the uh, country uh, partners uh, from the Gavi Country Learning Hubs in Bangladesh, Mali, but also as there are many Nigerians and Ugandans uh, attending today's session, the Nigeria and Uganda um, Country uh, Learning Hubs. Uh, we have the partner names here. Uh, and then we have today participants from 84 countries. Um, so you can see here by countries, the ones in red are the Gavi Zero Dose Learning Hub countries, but you can see that this question of zero dose resulted in interest from all over the world. Um, we, Of course, the slides are both in French and in English. And then the key question is, well, who are the attendees? Are they actually involved in zero dose work? And actually 89% of them are. Uh, the second question is, okay, so they're involved in zero dose, but are they people, technical officers working at the global level in North America or Western Europe? And no, it turns out that most of the practitioners who signed up for today's event are in fact from work in facilities, districts, and regions, with all, also, and very important, national planners and international partners in the room. Uh, with a split, let's say, you know, two thirds, one third between men and women, uh, here is the slide in French for the uh, Francophone. Uh, today's event is only one step in the process. 421 of you shared experiences before the event, shared your zero dose experience, 42 from Mali, eight from Bangladesh. And today we're listening and learning together before the next phase of the ZDLHX, which is about application, which is how you take lessons learned, successes, challenges, peer learning, and use it to change yourself and to change uh, what you do around you in order to, uh, uh, to lead change. Back to you, Charlotte, uh, for the next part of the discussion.
Uh, thank you so much, Reda. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, Francois and Mohamed Sora. Um, we'd like to, I'd like right now to invite uh, Fuseini Dembele. Uh, Fuseini, I'm just uh, trying to invite to unmute. Fuseini Dembele, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, uh, so please, I would like to invite you to start by introducing yourself. Hey, hey. Oui, oui. Bon, bonjour, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Je suis Dr. Fuseni Damlé, immunisation officière au bureau de jeunes de, jeune de GAO, UNICEF. Donc, uh, you work for you, UNICEF? So I work uh, here in GAO for UNICEF. Thanks for the question. So we are in a conflict area. Therefore, access is not easy. The immunization teams cannot come and reach this area. So there are some villages, unfortunately, that are left behind because it's uh, extremely difficult here because of the security situation. We also have uh, centers who, health centers were shut down due to the conflict situation. And uh, the uh, uh, HCPs as well have left because of this insecurity. So that's why we have this situation with the zero dose communities. So that's very important. And uh, our study and our qualitative study showed that the main obstacle to immunization is access to the services, accessing the health center and have uh, here uh, the authorization to get to this health center. So some areas are very, very difficult to access because of the uh, security situation. My next question is, uh, so what you are do what are you doing now to reach, uh, to identify and reach these zero dose communities? And what difference is that making? Merci pour cette question. Thank you for this question. So these uh, zero dose communities, are, as I said, difficult to reach. So after conducting an analysis and an assessment of the situation, we had the opportunity during a festival, gathering several villages and children with their mothers attended a lot of the festivities in Bamba, so people were coming with their children, so that's how we managed here to have a good idea of uh, basically the under-vaccinated population, the zero-dose children, so that's what we did during the, the this festival so that we knew children would be there with their uh, legal representative with their mothers or fathers and uh, that was very good for us to contribute okay. and, uh, i just want to find out from you is that a festival an annual festival how often does it uh, uh, occur It's a festival organized usually very regularly, but because of the security situation, you know, it's not organized as regularly as before, but it's, um, it's a kind of a cultural and a handicraft festival. 
And there's also like some dancing. So for a week, each village, uh, he presents basically uh, its traditions with dancing and songs. And uh, here, this is, uh, of course, uh, something that uh, we also grab this opportunity with the organizers to really, you know, do some uh, awareness on the zero dose. So everyone then was there with the civil society, with the young people, with children, with their mothers. So that was, that was important for the success here. And all those uh, stakeholders, how did you get them to engage? What did you say to get them to see that this was a good idea for them to buy as far as uh, reaching on the immunized communities is concerned? Well, the party de Rissi. The gens, selon notre enquête, les gens ont... We started with their stories. Because we know that there is a strong interest in, in immunization and we know that uh, children have not and there's like some outbreaks. So there's meningitis is a huge problem. So I think people are, are scared somehow. So once you kind of discussed with them, well, that's what we really did and uh, try to promote and uh, uh, immunization for the children. So, we used an analysis that took into account women and, um, and men and tried to educate them to locate obstacles that were preventing these children from being vaccinated. And so that's why we organized advocacy uh, work and advocates within all of the villages. We had a representation um, of those particular villages within the process of identifying those blockages um, to identify those obstacles. We had civil societies, we had religious leaders, we had community leaders. We engaged them all to make sure that we set up an activity that would be successful. One last question for you, and I'm sure that is a question that is on many minds and it's even reflected in the chat. So my question for you is, how did this turn out? You know, what was the result of this activity? And how do you know that what you did or what you are doing is successful? So here we are talking about results. So, uh, first of all, we use um, uh, vaccination um, analysis and it did it a, a sense a looked at the census and estimated uh the number of children that were at the beginning of our activity that that were not actually reached and then at the end how many of them were actually vaccinated that we were actually able to reach and then we were able to see that all of those children that were able came into our um, project regions, um, they all received vaccinations and we were able to then compare the before and the after. But even before receiving those results, we saw within those results that about 80% or 90% of those um, people who participated in the festivals that we did in the villages to actually um, do some education and vaccination were actually vaccinated at that time and thank you very much any to show that it can that we can succeed even in zones where there is conflict and and um that e even when there's no access where it's very complicated but at the same time you showed that there was an opportunity that within the villages that, it, that they would get together they would get into the city of bamba 
that seems to itself be a safe place where there's no, where there aren't as many um, safety problems. And that sort of innovation, it really can convince people when there are a lot of insecure areas and that's why they're not being covered appropriately. But you said that there were 21 villages or something like that in the area. Did all of the villages come? Did absolutely everyone come? And then also, um, and, and we saw that, that there, you know, even though they, that those that came actually did participate in the vaccination of their children. So were there villages that didn't come? Were there any that were missed? And then the second point that I have is uh, you were able to do uh, a lot of catch up on zero dose children or even do a first or a second dose of certain vaccines. What did you do to maintain the vaccine level and to be able to um, catch up with those that were lost to follow up? Because you had these festivals, which were one off events. But how were you able to monitor and then follow up with those people afterwards? Thank you very much. So. Um, on, on in, within this particular project, the villages that were, they were all asked to come, and we actually did a lot of work to try and encourage them to come, that they were um, educated beforehand, that all of the children needed to be vaccinated, and they were very motivated, actually, to come because the there were a lot of epidemics that were occurring. And so, um, and when we talked to, about that, a lot of the advocates, um, uh, we saw that, you know, it wasn't all of the the um, of vaccines that, that were able to necessarily um, uh, be given, you know, uh, because they, there was a lot of um, unknowns or people who had um, incorrect beliefs. So we were able to do a lot of the measles vaccines and ones that had been missed because of that, uh, particularly the measles vaccine. Um, we showed them the interest, uh, what, why it was important for them to actually come um, to have their children actually receive their dose. Um, so in terms of continuity um, and sustainability, so we discussed that at length. So outside of the festivals or the other uh, large meetings um, where we're able to vaccinate a lot of people, we put together mobile clinics to be able to um, get to um, like the burqa areas um, where a lot of people will actually come to either will go to that particular village um, uh, for market days or whatever. So we were able to do uh, a second vaccination program to be able to get to those particular people who didn't come to the first festivals. But the thing is, is that yes, is the, the is a follow up. Is we also needed, to, you know, we have also the um, a malaria program that is also looking into malnutrition and a lot of other things, and we used that um, as, as it was a really well developed program, um, and that was really working on um, uh, achieving and 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 reaching those um, under uh, underrepresented communities, or rural and remote communities. So we we actually used them to help us. Uh, do some follow-up. Okay, a last question, and, and I see Julie actually asked this in the chat. This is a, a, a question that I really um, feel strongly about. Does uh, Is vaccination being offered to pregnant women? You didn't talk about it, but I think that um, the vaccination that was given to children who are zero dose, I imagine there were young women who are also a young pregnant women who are also zero dose. It, w it was not something that we did, but during the festivals, um, it was it was a lot of integration. So a lot of pregnant women were very involved and we, we made sure that we concentrated on um, them for vaccination. Um, and we tried to take advantage of those particular um, events to do prenatal consultations and eventually, yes, give them dose, uh, doses of vaccinations if it was appropriate. Um, uh, but yeah, everything everything was taken into account. All of that was done. Um, all communities, all underrepresented communities um, and underrepresented people were taken into account for vaccination. Okay, thank you so much. And maybe Charlotte will talk to you about some of the questions that are being asked to you within the chat. And so maybe Charlotte would like to go ahead. Yes, thank you, Francois and Husseini. Reda, Reda, you have been looking at the chat. Uh, probably there are some comments you want to highlight or some other questions that are addressed at uh, uh, Fuseni 
and uh, other colleagues from Mali. Yes, indeed, uh, Charlotte. So um, I look first to the Q&A and encourage um, uh, participants to vote for the questions that they really want to see answered. Of course, we're receiving dozens of questions. Uh, we hope that the zero-dose practitioners from Bangladesh and Mali have answered many of them already. But I'd like to point to Boma Otobo, who is... Uh, uh, I, uh, whom we know as the former uh, Deputy Director of NERIC in Nigeria, a uh, Gavi Zero Dose Learning Hub country. Uh, so first of all, she says for the Mali presentation, well done. Uh, she does have a question for Fuseni Dembele, which is how do you ensure that those who are due for subsequent doses of vaccines do come back? It was not clear if outreaches were done. Um, she also appreciates the fact that you work in insecure places and are still able to reach some children. So question about follow-up and outreach, uh, Charlotte, for uh, Fuseni. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, let me see. So um, uh, see for Arthur Merci Fidelis, Mitsampito, one more question of Fuseni. Um, is uh, in this zone, uh, dans cette zone, N'existe-t-il pas de barrières socioculturelles? In this zone, are there any religious or cultural barriers? Back to you, uh, Fuseni and Charlotte. Voilà, pour le suivi. Yes, okay, as far as follow-up. Uh, that... And this particular activity was welcomed within the vaccinal, vaccination program at the regional level and at the uh, health district level. And so, and, and for all of the rural zones. And so um, it was integrated into programs. And so that was a pro proposition that was given to those communities and they were already involved and, and, and engaged in the advocacy. And so their engagement meant that afterwards they did their own sort of follow-up and that which we supported and there were um community health agents that started to um uh, do a follow-up with all of those children so at every at each time that we came they would show us the list of those children who had received their follow-up doses uh the doses during the festivals and then those that couldn't come to the actual festival they had a list of them so that we could do a follow-up with them um into those areas and and that's where we did the uh, mobile clinic um, mobile clinic events in the particular villages that we were able to do that where a lot of people from smaller villages came and then uh we tried to make sure that the activity was sustained and that it was continuous yes excuse me charlotte uh one clarification is a very good question this is continuity this is uh, this follow-up this is a very good question for a lot of zones where you can go you can actually give vaccination but you don't know when you can get back so i think another question is um success criteria because you were talking about those uh, community service those uh, health community agents and that kept lists and the thing about keeping those lists and thinking about the risks of safety can you clarify a little bit what happens with this commute uh, those health community agents who stayed within those villages even though there was already a safety problem were you in regular communication with them yes in terms of the uh, communication that in occurred with them um, they are uh, people who live in those communities they don't leave and um, when they're there they don't uh, attack everyone um, and when women are there they're also considered that you know they're not considered to be on one side or the other and so we can see that uh, there's a, there's been a, a, a lot of communication with uh, the the local indigenous uh, healthcare agents and so that they're they're really sort of um, uh, uh, they, they they are not facing the same risk um, because of their role as a health community a healthcare community agent, and they're the ones that help us to actually uh, reach those zero dose children and those uh, zero dose communities or under uh, under vaccinated communities. But uh, through um, a dialogue that we're able to tr to to uh, implement, we were able to try to 
um, put together an activity that responded to the context itself and it was very adapted to the context. So your project is not just the festivals that you do with all of the partners, but you also have the mobile clinic that goes into these zones regardless of the safety concerns. Is that true? Yes, exactly. The mobile clinic as well. Um, uh, the people who come that to that mobile clinic um, and the health care community agents that come there, um, they're in a, those are in safer areas, but those particular um, agents that that they come to us at those uh, mobile clinics and they they do um, uh, come back to us. So they'll go out into the local villages and then they'll come back to our mobile clinic so they don't actually they don't actually stay there um and so that's how we get into those conflict zones and and they live the reality uh, disease and epidemics exist and are there in their communities and they see them firsthand and so they are completely aware that they have to um fight against the epi epidemics and in order to do that they have to vaccinate children and they accept that 100 percent. they're fully engaged and they collaborate 100 percent with the community so at the end of the day with your experience um a, which is a success um in very complicated very difficult safety situations, what are three key messages that you would want to share with those who are listening to you today that are uh, maybe in a similar situation and need to address the same barriers that you do? I would say the three key messages that I'd like to say is first to work with the community because in so doing, we can reach zero dose children. Um, by working within the communities and working with the people in those communities. And we all use, always have to engage with the community, particularly um, the uh, civil civil society organizations as well and the commu uh, healthcare community agents, people who are actually there on uh, in the field. And then you need to also show, concretely show, to communities that vaccination will get rid of epidemics because they will be, they, they believe that they will always exist uh, but the thing is is that disease is a reality that they have to live with and that is something that can be treated and then we can do that through reaching zero dose children and you really have to talk on their level and work together to be able to um achieve the goals together thank you very much And lots of questions and comments in the chat uh, for for you, Fuseini, uh, based on this uh, 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 zero dose experience that you have shared. I would like to there was a question on the logistics, how to mobilize uh, 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 all that is 21 villages mobilized for this festival. How did you go about organizing the logistics around uh, for uh, this uh, to vaccinate all of the participants? This was a question from Olivier Connor. Olivier, uh, I'm inviting you to unmute yourself so that well, you can ask this question to Fuseni so that we get to hear from him before we move forward. Merci, merci. Pour attendre... Thank you. Um, yes. Olivier Conan, yes. n'oubliez pas de vous présenter d'abord et yeah, de nous dire pourquoi cette question vous a interpellé. Don't forget to introduce yourself and to talk about the question that you're asking as well. Uh, yes, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Fuseni, for this experience, um, for sharing your experience. I'm the communication and... Um, knowledge sharing um, manager uh, through RAISE in uh, the Sahel zone. And I am asking you this question because we're also working on the same question in terms of vaccin vaccination access to the community. And it's a really nice approach that you're using to be able to pr to create a safe space uh, to get people to come to a festival. But one of the things is that um, you, know, you did this over a one week period. How did you manage the logistics? Because those need to come to get vaccinated. They also need to be treated. I mean, they, they need to receive an interview because a lot of uh, the people um, will come from those villages and then they'll go back and then they're still they're not where they were before because they leave and so how to, how did you actually um, do this logistically because I'd like to really share this experience with our interventional country and to see what that can uh, what that can do here thank you okay, uh, merci, 
Okay, thank you, Olivier Kona. Husseini can respond. Turn on your microphone. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. I just uh, opened it. So in terms of the logistics, it's not only the the location uh, that's important. The decision was made and it was um, actually proposed to the province uh, to the at the district level, the regional level. So um, all of the people that were that that could, I mean, we we moved absolutely everything refrigerators um, into Bamba so that we were able to increase the capacity of being of the of our ability to be able to um, store the vaccines and uh, we also used accumulators with um, isotherm boxes to make sure that we were properly storing our vaccines and then once we were actually doing the treatment the the festival organizers they um, had a lot of food at Bugu and make sure and, and and we saw that absolutely every family was represented within Bamba and so it was all of the parents the grandparents the cousins um, and even their friends who were very honored actually to be welcomed in and to to have this warm welcome and and so that kind of community um, uh, link uh, really helped and um and and so we used families actually due to a lot of logistical organization of themselves and then over the, uh, during the f the festival we went to each of the families to uh, give them a little bit of help um so that the the festival would be as uh, wonderful as possible thank you thank you very much Fuseni and Nimbele Daryl on the involvement of husband, that is, we know about gender barriers that are linked with uh, immunization. And there was a question around the involvement of, of husbands or fathers in the in supporting their wives to uh, uh, get their children, to get uh, uh, pregnant women uh, vaccinated. So how was that in, your, in, the, in this particular case? Merci. Thank Merci you. Beaucoup. Thank you very much for that question. So in terms of, of, of that, the, the gender barrier, everyone in those regions, we, we did a lot of, uh, they, they, they already knew and, and recognized the, uh, the need for vaccination because they had lived through and they were living through um, the measles epidemic and they Everyone knew that without a vaccination, they wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to stop a measles epidemic or any other sort of epi epidemic, and that it would only be prevented through epidemic, uh, through vaccination. And thanks to the awareness building that was done beforehand, those that came to Bamba, um, uh, if they couldn't come during, if they didn't want to, or if they didn't come during that particular event, it was very, it would be very, very difficult. We had to do a lot of awareness building, a lot of publicity, um, and and they insisted. Um, uh, they they talked to the communities, and a lot of the the men, a lot of the 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 husbands and the fathers actually insisted that their um, wives. And young mothers go and make sure that they did not even come back until all of the children had been vaccinated and that was the thing that that barrier though that particular obstacle had already been um overcome and so for for us it was really just make sure that there was uh, transportation for them um and but the decision that barrier of decision making of taking the decisions um for the women and the children had already been overcome um through our awareness building campaign and, and in that context um, and in that particular environment, uh, it, it it really made sure that our activity was a success. Maybe maybe a little question to try and understand the situation in Bomba and maybe in the district. What proportion of the population was affected by this uh, risk problem? What is it? Eighty percent of the population over the surface that 
Or is it less? Uh, uh, what proportion was affected? Uh, we could say that it was, um, uh, other than than just the city, outside of the city, I think it was 80%. 80% are, are affected by um, an unsafe environment. Yes. Uh, once again, thank you, François, and uh, thank you, Fuseli. Uh, Palenfo Traman, uh, Palenfo, I'm inviting you to unmute yourself. You're going to just uh, give us a synthesis of the, the key points from uh, the two uh, our two speakers, uh, Mohamed Sohar from uh, Bangladesh and Fuseni Dembele from uh, 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 Mali. And uh, also, what what are your reflections and uh, what is the what is the significance of these uh, uh, experiences shared for zero dose practitioners that are listening today? Oui, merci, merci. Uh... Yes, thank you, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you to all of the participants and all of the presenters. So. In order to summarize a little bit the situation, we're looking at two countries that are ge geographically quite different in, in different contexts. Um, but when we look at those stories, we're looking at very specific and uh, very specific uh, contexts. We have geographic difficulties in terms of a uh, large surface area, um, we have uh, insecurity. Um, in Bangladesh, we have uh, mountain regions and borders that cause problems. And then in Mali, we also have uh, conflict areas um, that cause a lot of barriers to vaccination. But in Bangladesh, we also have flood zones, um, areas that can be um, completely submerged in water very quickly. And these are very different geographies. But the thing is, is that they are both um, facing the same problem, which is zero dose and under vaccinated children, children that we can't um, provide vaccination services, um, even in their different situations, but very sa similar problems that need to be uh, need to be solved. Now, what came out from both uh, presenters is that, in fact, uh, for these zero dose children and the zero dose problem, they're looking at um, very specific steps that need to be taken in order to put together specific actions. Um, they each brought up in terms of the question of zero dose and everything around that, uh, under vaccinated, insufficiently vaccinated. Um, but they needed to characterize those populations in order to, and then that characterization, that sort of analysis work needed to define that group through a certain number of questions that they had to ask themselves in order to be able to uh, figure out who uh, they were going to target. So who are the communities, who are the children, and, and who they are, wh what are their, uh, what are the things that actually cause them to be zero dose? And once that first step has been addressed, and then afterwards is the why, is why would they allow uh, what kind of strategies would actually allow for them to be vaccinated? So that the why as well. And then the third step, they all, they both showed what kind of actions they've set in place to try and reach those children. And there were a lot of questions that were asked by Francois and the other panelists is that to try and reach them is to also try and make sure that work becomes integrated into a more sustainable program that it's not just something that get and this is Gavi's goal as well that it's not just something that happens as a one-off so clearly both presented presenters showed that something that was important was to have a, a a plan that is adaptable to the region and to the context and that would benefit that particular target group and the practitioners used the human centered design strategy to define along with the community actors together so that they could have a sustainable impact and that it would be something that could be on a continuous sort of program and engagement by making sure that those stakeholders, that those important actors, those key actors are engaged in every step of the process. 
And then through that, they were able to not just develop their strategy, but they both set up an approach that was defended by the WHO to be able to, uh, to, uh, to get into each district, each community, and to be able to reach each child. And we see that that question of management, of planning, and implication and, and, and community engagement was very important. And, and in order to be able to do that, they had to do the design together along with the community itself. And one of the things that I noticed for Mali was to use a community opportunity that was already a community practice, such as a festival where there's already a, lot, a large amount of people who are gathered together and to be able to take advantage of that. And another strategy that they used was a mobile clinic and to be able to use um, uh, uh, consultations at events and while they were using their mobile clinic. And to have um, in Bangladesh, they had community involvement, but they also had to make sure that they had healthcare stakeholders that were fully involved that would allow them to be able to go into a, a, a more regular contact with the populations that are more often either at the borders or in flood zones to be able to have more regular contact with them and to integrate their priorities into the overall priorities of the local authorities, of the government itself, and always with this idea of keeping in mind this suggestion of how they could be an integral stakeholder within all of the governmental activities of, of reaching zero dose children. And so that's a, a bit of a summary of this particular experience. So uh, of these particular presentations so far. Thank you very much, Charlotte. For, to Reda for a brief pause uh, before we move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you to all the uh, Mali and Bangladesh speakers and those from many, many other countries, including uh, Gavi Zero Dose Learning Hub, uh, country learning hubs uh, from Uganda and Nigeria, who are also uh, with us in the room today. Just a reminder, 1,964 uh practitioners uh, from 84 countries registered for uh, today's event and what you're hearing is first-hand accounts really reflecting upon the two stories we've just heard two there are many others in the room who have shared stories uh, but uh, we've heard just two so far and there are stories of how change actually happens on the front lines in zones of conflicts in uh, rural areas and remote rural areas in um uh, urban uh, areas as well. Uh, remember who's in the room. We are together and 89% of you are directly involved in uh, zero dose work. Most of you are from the so-called lower levels of the system, from districts, from facilities, from regions and states. And we know increasingly there is growing recognition that what you do, how you're doing it, and what it takes to make it work uh, may be an important part and uh, of the uh, zero dose agenda today is just one step in the process 421 of you shared experiences before uh, this uh, this event and looking forward right after this event we'll be asking you uh, for feedback on what you've learned what your reflections are if participation in this type of activity in this kind of network learning has made any difference for you and if so what are you going to do differently when you go back to your daily work of trying to identify then reach then monitor and measure then advocate uh, for zero dose children and missed communities it is all about leading change and we believe that when solving tackling complex problems like this one uh, it is about sharing sure uh, but it is ab about process improvements, what you change, small things that you you can change at the local level that is within your reach that can make a big difference. And that's what uh, some of what we heard in the stories from Sower Alam from Bangladesh and Fuseni Dembele from uh, Mali. Back to you, uh, Charlotte, as we've just uh, gone over the first hour. We only have a few, uh, less than half an hour left now as we have many more stories and we're hoping that other Zero Dose practitioners will continue to share um, their stories and experiences. Back to you. Thank you, Reda. Earlier on, uh, we had Fantamali Kamara that was lined up to speak and uh, we had to cut him short. So right now I would like to invite him. Uh, but Fantamada, once again, please, can you go yes. ahead and introduce Hello, yourself? Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, yes. Hello, good afternoon. 
Thank you for this opportunity. I'm uh, Dr. Kamada from Mali. I uh, work at the uh, UN for UNICEF in the Sikasso area. I am a here a scholar. That's it for my presentation. Okay. You've, do you have questions? My first question to you was, what is the zero dose situation where you were? And how do you know that that is a problem? Okay, merci beaucoup. Okay. Thank you for the question. So you're right. The zero dose situation here is, is a problem. Uh, because when we look at our uh, databases, but also in practice, we realize that there are issues. And we know that we have, we know that in my area here, we have about 1,400 zero dose children. So that's only for the area what is in the database. So we do understand there is a problem in our region. Doing about it, why and how? Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you for the question again. So, what are we doing? Why and how? First, we've analyzed the situation. We're trying to look at the tools that we have, including, of course, here the information, here and the data, the evidence we have already collected through different tools in other projects. And then you also have to include some very practical action at the level of the communities. So we have a lot of the community platforms working with the communities to like a physically identify here the zero dose children. So that's uh, really important for us because it's also about understanding what is needed. So we really need to facilitate uh, the, our work. That's that's what is important because the pro the problem is really to reach these, these zero dose children. Engagement and working with uh, 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 community platforms. What concretely do you do? How do they go to the community to engage with uh, with with caregivers, with mothers, with parents to be able to determine the vaccination status? of uh, uh, their words, their children, and what tools are you using to do this? So the community platforms are really the members of the community. So the members of the community, of course, participate in the platform and it's true that um, we can of course rely uh, here on uh, also uh, other services including the social services for the uh, here promotion of uh, health care, but also child protection activities and social activities. So this is what we are doing. So we kind of um, contact also the leaders of the community that they, they are involved. And it's important really because we try to use already the programs that are in place really to, to kind of uh, avoid duplicating. Uh, 
Okay. Donc, de, dans le temps, et, en tout cas, c'est, c'est encore mieux que nous avons trouvé que... It's just that now... We have realized, of course, that uh, having only here the uh, health technicians or health professionals, it's not enough for the for the community. Uh, so we really need to involve uh, different partners. So that's what we are doing now to really involve the whole community with the community leaders with uh, here the uh, organization the, uh, civil society organization so all this is a uh, is a uh, really important so so how has it turned out uh, with everything that you are doing uh, with the support from the community Donc, dans le, si je parle du contexte spécifique de, de la stratégie... So, if I stay within this uh, specific context, it's true that um, this is really about the support at national level. So, So, really, what we try to do is to, to, to look at the results. Because, of course, we looked also at the uh, more uh, itemized uh, information, look at the different districts. And we also looked at the difference between like the zero dose here, here, because we have to make the difference between the zero dose children and, of course, uh, the under vaccinated communities. So we kind of make the link also with the database, with the evidence that was collected. And, but what is key really is to involve all the stakeholders. That's really important. That's how we were able to identify So I think that with this OA involvement, so then there is a really like a, a training, of course, provided also to, to see how you can really promote here access to immunization. And uh, we already had some information, as I said, on the zero dose children. Unfortunately, we, we just lost uh, Dr. Kama, Kamara. We I am uh, really sorry. We can't hear you right now. It's very hard to hear you currently. I'm sorry, we're just going to have to wait a few seconds here. So I'm really sorry, it's, it's very difficult to hear. Okay, may I take the floor? Yes, of course. I am uh, Dr. Kone Ibrahima. I uh, work at the CICASO uh, here region. And just to take over from my colleague, so it's true that uh, here we've been really supported by uh, UNICEF on this uh, strategy. So as uh, it was said, 
So we were able to really identify uh, 1,700 uh, zero-dose children. So when it comes to active research, well, we also used uh, women's associations, so three groups, women's groups, to try to actually identify these children. So thanks to this work, we organized uh, here these focus groups. And that's how we were able here to catch up on and vaccinate uh, about 600 children. And there was also like a survey that was organized to organize and to better understand uh, uh, here the needs. And we realized that many are those that uh, don't really understand um, the needs when it comes to immunization, that sometimes it's not clear for the families how many doses should be administered. And there's also like a, a question of uh, expenses. Is that expensive to get to a center? So all these elements have to be taken into account, at least in our region. So, supported by the ministry, this is what we are doing. So, we can uh, promote uh, this strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kone. Before you leave, I do have another question. So, uh, do you have uh, gen uh, challenges related to um, uh, uh, access to services that uh, 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 could be better resolved if you uh, integrated the gender perspective? How uh, I know you talked about uh, involving women's association, but considering uh, the decision making power, how did you get fathers involved in this? I don't know if. Uh, we yes. I understood your question. Yes, please. So, of course, uh, here uh, we have a, a local organization uh, and um, we are therefore supported for the implementation here uh, here of different groups. So as I said, there are several already women's group. So that's, that's really good. And that's the first uh, point of contact, I will say, in this approach. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for sharing that. Uh, we have just 15 minutes okay. left. Uh, uh, yes? yes? Can you hear me? Thank you uh, to the doctor. Um, as he was saying, we even had two sessions where we talked to the father of children. And we were able to use that in our analysis and f make sure that each healthcare region um, had been had been analyzed and and to make sure that there was no gender gap um, in terms of vaccination status for the children and to also make sure that we engaged the fathers of each community um, and a lot of the women um, that worked with us a lot of the community health actors that worked with us were women who are very well respected in their areas and we asked them to continue to work with us to make sure that all of the members um, were in a WhatsApp group. And we distributed data that way through all of the communities. And um, by distributing that data, we were able to uh, make sure that there was a lot of awareness building done through that particular tool in each community. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kone. Uh, 
before uh, we go again, I would like us to listen to um, a colleague from Bangladesh. And uh, I'm inviting uh, Mohammed Shahidula. I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself. And my question to you is, uh, uh, when you listen to all that which has been shared here today, but most especially to what was uh, shared by uh, a, a Fantamatic Camera concerning the zero dose challenge and what they are doing to reach uh, zero dose and on on the immunized uh, communities in uh, mali uh how different is this from what you know in your own context and uh what can you tell us about uh, your own context and i'll invite you to introduce yourself first uh, uh before you speak uh dr mohammed shaidullah are you able to unmute and we have just 12 minutes to go. Okay. okay. Yes, please, Thank over you. to you. My name is Dr. Shwedullah. Uh, I am working as a medical officer in Bangladesh, Bojan Morissa's foundation. Uh, actually, we have uh, active surveillance in my working area where my uh, CSW uh, daily visited to remote area. Uh, though our uh, surveillance is actually project based, uh, last year we have a survey in our area where this is very difficult to find zero dose children. But during COVID nineteen, actually we don't we don't have any data uh, about uh, zero dose practitioner. So we have to take this data. Uh, but uh, we have faced actually for uh, here. Uh, actually availability of vaccine and cold chain issue in our area. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mohamed Shahidullah, and thanks for respecting our time. I see we have a raised hand uh, 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 from Julien, Julien Ramanandai. Uh, Julien, uh, are you able to on? Mute yourself. And the question to you is, uh, the question is like, what has been shared in the chat already? When you listen to this story, uh, um, does it look like the challenge you're facing? And uh, what is your own, uh, or do you want to share your own zero dose uh, challenge or experience with us? Julia, are you able to unmute yourself? I'm inviting Julian to unmute. Looks like his hand went back down. So if there are others who would like to speak, this is probably the we're we're in the last few minutes for this DDLA checks, even if as I as we have emphasized, this is only one step in a learning to change process, in a in a learning to action uh, pathway. Gloria and Yan Wu, we would love to hear from you. Um, Gloria, you've been listening to presentations and, and sharing of experience from uh, colleagues from Bangladesh and Mali, uh, some of the guides on the side. Gloria, what's, um, what's on your mind? Don't forget to introduce yourself. We'd love to hear a few more voices before we, uh, uh, we close. We also have, uh, let's see, so, yes, uh, Gloria, we hear okay. your, um, <laughs> your, your phone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, exactly. I don't know. Okay, my name is Gloria and I'm from Nigeria. Uh, Gloria, it sounds like you have somebody talking right behind you. Can you move to a quiet place? Okay, she's, she has uh, muted herself again. We would have loved to hear more from uh, Gloria. We also have... Um, let's yes, Gloria. Can you hear me now? Yes, but it's, you still have a lot of background noise, so please speak very... Please speak very loudly and tell us who you are and what is your comment or or, uh, or thoughts on what you've heard today. Okay, I would want to give my thoughts. I'm sorry, I'm from Nigeria and I'm a question with Sudani. So on zero dose, we are trying to, to look at how best we could look at the rulers in the communities to see how we could reach these zero dose children. So I think it's something that all the countries should try to practice. Gloria, wh where do you energy, work? Where in Nigeria do you work and, and what do you do I exactly? Work, okay, I work with Sida to help the government do primary health care services. So, and we particularly look at immunizations, routine immunizations and 
precisely polio because Nigeria right now is experiencing circulating vaccine derived polio after we've been certified polio free. So getting zero dose children is very important. And the approach we're trying to use right now in Nigeria is using the community leaders, people who are the most closest to the people in the community, who could be able to identify when a newborn child is in a community. So when you use those people who are closer to the people in the community, and even when you have resistance, you're able to resolve that resistance through their own people. So I think it's something that other nations should look at mm. and try to put into practice. Thank and you, Gloria. Yes, thank you. We understood your point. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that uh, the um, next uh, ZDLH um, uh, Zero Dose Learning Hub exchange will be focused on Nigeria and Uganda. So we look forward to your contributions then. We're looking for reflections on what you heard today and the stories that were shared today. Uh, as a Zero Dose practitioner yourself, when you listen to these insights, these experiences, how different is it from the Zero Dose challenge that you face? No one right now can claim to have the solution or else there would be no zero dose children in that country and i do not believe that to be the case now we have six minutes remaining uh, on the clock uh, we do have with us uh, from uh, the um uh, let me see um yes yeah, so we were some some of the uh, some of the ministry of health um EPI uh, national planners and strategists uh, that we want to, uh, uh, at the very least, acknowledge. And perhaps uh, if uh, one or more of them is in the room, we could ask for their reflections in order to uh, uh, to close this session. We also want to uh, acknowledge the uh, uh, Gavi country learning hubs in Bangladesh, Mali, Nigeria, and Uganda for their outstanding support in preparing this event. And as I said, today's event is just one step in a learning to action process as we hear from the front lines what is actually making the difference what do the challenges look like what are people doing about their situation and how do they know if it's having the uh, the desired effect uh, back to you charlotte uh, i'll let you lead to figure to figure out uh, how we bring this uh, very exciting very dynamic session to a close knowing that there were all, nearly 2000 people who registered from 84 countries in order to spend 90 minutes discussing zero dose back to you thank you very much reda and once again thank you everyone for the active participation the comments in the chat are a testament of uh, your interest on the zero dose topic i was just trying to invite professor nyare uh uh uh, 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 uh from uh, uh the country learning hub uh, in mali uh, Professor Fanta, if you can uh, unmute yourself to tell us, uh, to share your thoughts. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Nyari is the director of the, uh, of the CAPEV, uh, the uh, Vaccine Equity uh, Learning Center in Mali. Yes, indeed. Fanta Nyari, we would love to hear uh, from you. And perhaps as you've been listening, you are one of the guides on the side. We'd yeah. love to hear your reflections. You heard outstanding contributions from uh, those who uh, are scholars in, uh, in, in Mali. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about this exchange? Um, wh what, what would you like us to, uh, to, to, to what will be, what will be the, for you the lesson learned that you will share with your colleagues in the national team? Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Hello. This is uh, Mosel Fantaniane. I am the coordinator for the CAPEV, uh, the Learning Center for Vaccine Equity in Mali. And the experiences were very enlightening because we saw that the zones are very different, the regions are very different. But in terms of, I even in one country, in Mali, the situation can be very different in different areas, whether it be in the north or in Sikasso, near the south. So um, those differences, Oh, we should capitalize on them because each zone has its own realities to deal with and to tackle. And we need to learn good lessons from those differences and those experiences that were shared 
showed how using those differences is a method to adapt, to follow logic, um, a logic that can be applied to those differences and that then yield results. And that is that is something that really enlightens me, really. It's very, I would like to thank this event for bringing that to light. It was, it was really very, uh, very good for us. And uh, the idea of teamwork and working together is something that really prevailed. And um, the, the healthcare centers can't solve the problems all by themselves. We need active involvement from um, the, those who are benefiting and, um, and really need to work together to achieve uh, and to reach those children and the, the using the, the, the festivals to be able to uh, reach as many children as possible. So thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the time to speak. Thank you very much, Professor Niare. Heidi Reynolds from Gavi. Uh, uh, Heidi, you have listened to all of these uh, uh, um, experiences that have been shared today on reach, identifying and reaching uh, zero dose. What one lesson are you taking away uh, from this uh, sharing and what surprised you? Thanks, everybody. Um, I What surprised me, I was in a good way very pleased to hear about the evidence is be being generated and used to inform some of these approaches. For example, the experience in Bangladesh with the rapid convenience monitoring, thought that was a very interesting approach that probably could be applicable elsewhere. And then <clears throat> again, in Mali, where they were using um, so much information through the, you know, through the community outreach and understanding the barriers and then responding to that. Um, I think, and then there were some really excellent questions in the chat, um, which I hope we have time to uh, pull through into some of our learning sessions um, in subsequent sessions. Just an excellent presentations and excellent questions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi Reynolds. Uh who leads the Zero Dose Learning Hub uh, project at Gavi together with Gus uh, Correa. Uh, we are, you are going to be sent uh, to the Zero Dose uh, Learning Hub page uh, right after this event, as soon as you close Zoom. It is right now available only in English, but will soon be available in French. You can learn more about the Gavi Zero Dose Learning Hub and you can already connect here. So we very much encourage you to do so. Before we close, um, as we're, yeah, we're actually at time, but I'd like you to do one final thing. Many of you have shared wonderful stories, uh, more than stories, insights, experiences, uh, how you are using data and what you're doing, what difference it's making. Uh, this is only the beginning. This is one step in the process. So the next step will be for you to share. We'll be asking you for lessons learned, successes, challenges, and this will be open to all countries, not only Bangladesh and Mali. Uh, what, has, what does this experience of hearing zero dose practitioners from all over the world change for you? What are you going to do differently? because this is about leading change and we believe that uh, this such sharing of experiences uh, can make a difference um, through the sharing of what makes the difference at the local levels today most of the attendees are directly involved in zero dose and work in health facilities districts and regions of your respective countries so look for the next step don't miss the uh the questions we'll be asking so you can give us feedback on this first gavi zero dose uh, learning hub event uh, and we'll be asking you to share your learning what you will do differently that is uh, the next step. The one thing I'd like to ask you to do, I said was, uh, even if you are in your office, people are going to stare at you, is I believe this is a well-deserved round of applause for everyone who contributed, participated before, during, or after. So I really appreciate uh, everything. You're taking the time. Many of you have to return back to your daily duties. And we thank you for having contributing to this uh, first uh, inter-country peer learning exchange held by the Gavi Zero Dose Learning Hub. Over to you, and I think Charlotte even has her webcam on, so let's put the spotlight on her. Um, go ahead, Charlotte. Well, thank you, everyone. It was a great event, a great learning experience, and uh, this is not the end. We are looking forward to connecting uh, 
uh, with you sometime in July, the dates <laughs> to be confirmed for Nigeria and Uganda, uh, a focus on Nigeria and Uganda share. As I said, it's not the end. We'll be looking, coming back to you to hear what you have learned today and what you will be doing with what you have learned and you have to tell us how it is going. So thanks everyone. Great. Thanks uh, to our partner. All right, we really want to thank, of course. All of the Gavi Zero Dose uh, partners that we've acknowledged today, of course, Gavi, JSI that is leading the Zero Dose Learning Hub Consortium, regional partner IIHMR, um, and as well as the uh, country uh, partners that we've already acknowledged and thank here. Thank you. Wishing you a great uh, Zero Dose day. Take care. Bye-bye. All of our guys from the side. Of course, guys and talented woman. Thank you very much, guys on the side. Merci as well as Jenny Sekera that's been working. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. 25 ZDLHX contributors from Bangladesh. We want to acknowledge many of them from the national level. Thank you for your participation. And 80 Mali contributors, many of them scholars of the Geneva Learning Foundation, members of the movement for Immunization Agenda 2030. It is not surprising to see you be amongst those who uh, made the greatest and most significant contributions. Uh, we hope that this will, uh, this will lead to greater recognition in the future. Uh, thank you once again. And we'll close now this event. You know, there's still 226 people in the room. No one wants to leave. <laughs> the next CDLH exchange, for those of you who stayed all the way to the end, Uganda and Nigeria will be sharing their zero-dose experiences. We are hoping to set the date in July. And uh, the CDLH team uh, will be in Kampala uh, next week. So we hope to meet some of you who are from uh, Uganda.